Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs and Concordia Leadership Council member. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome, Minister. We're delighted you're here at Concordia. We have a very interesting topic uh, this afternoon. We're going to focus on the influence of small state actors. Minister, tell us why do small state actors make a difference in the global community and on the global scene? Well, uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, thank you, uh, Paula, for uh, hosting me here and to thank Concordia. Uh, for making the time for this session. Uh, small state matters uh, always. And uh, when it comes, when you look at uh, small states, uh, it's, they, have, they are enjoying certain benefits which the other big states, they, they might not have. Uh, first of all, uh, either they will be geographically uh, located in, in a strategic position, or they will have a unique uh, resource that uh, uh, make, make them uh, more uh, needed by, by other uh, countries. And they never represent a threat for any other countries. So forging alliances with, with the small states always being very useful and very successful with, with other uh, big nations. And also, if you will look at them from performance uh, uh, angle, uh, they have the efficiency flexibility and adaptability, they are more agile in moving than uh, the bigger states. Today, if you will look at the United Nations, uh, what uh, the countries which are represented here in, in, uh, in the United Nations, most of them, they are, uh, the majority is small states. And they have the equal rights uh, with the big states, not on all the levels. But at least on the General Assembly level, they, they, are, they are enjoying the same uh, vote. And uh, it doesn't matter if uh, a small state like Qatar or a small island uh, somewhere in the Pacific, uh, they vote together with China, Russia, and the United States. So uh, I think the multilateralism has enhanced the role of small states in, in the world scene. But share with us some of the obstacles which uh, small state actors do confront. You picked out a setting of the United Nations equal votes, but what are some of the obstacles that come readily to your mind? Well, uh, normally multilateral mechanisms uh, is, is makes as, as a safeguard for, for the small states that protect the rights of small states and uh, uh, you know, safeguard the sovereignty of, of those small states and making them more, uh, they can contribute much better uh, to, to the global affairs. But when those multilateral uh, mechanisms fail to address these concerns of, of small states and doesn't have the binding uh, uh, mechanism to preserve the rights of, of the small states, then it represents a big obstacle for them. And you have always, in, in the world stage, you will have a good actors and bad actors. So the small states are more vulnerable for those bad actors sometimes. And what we would like to see as, as a small state, we would like to see an effective multilateral mechanism that can resolve all these disputes in, in a peaceful manner. Qatar matters, like, for example, as a small state, we we look at uh, diplomacy as the only way forward for resolving any dispute. So uh, what happened with, with our country in, uh, since 2017, when, when the blockade was imposed by, by our neighbors, we didn't see any mechanism, uh, peaceful mechanism, that can resolve uh, this, this issue. And even the GCC, which is considered a multilateral regional mechanism, failed to solve it. So I think we need to look at more uh, regional and multilateral mechanisms that help small states to preserve their rights and solving all these disputes by, by a peaceful manner. Can you give uh, a, an example uh, separate from the one you just cited, but in the context of the Middle East, because there are so many issues that are focused on in crises in the Middle East. Let's take the issue of Iran, for example, and the various tensions that have been 
uh, uh, surrounding uh, relations with Iran. How can small state actors be applied to that situation? Well, uh, Iran has, has, has a unique position with Qatar uh, because of, of different circumstances. Once, one is geography, which matters a lot. They are next door neighbor. But another one also, they are like the only link for Qatar to breathe from. This is the only airspace that we can fly over, etc. But even without the current circumstances and without the Gulf crisis, Qatar as a small state never represents a threat for any of the countries. So even if we have differences and disagreement with, with any country, we still have the relationship. We still have the communication, which is an open channel. So, and as I mentioned at the beginning, when uh, small countries never represent a threat, they can bridge, uh, build the bridges between uh, disputed nations. And we, pro we proved that this has been a successful path for, for different conflicts. For example, now if you look at, at Iran, uh, uh, the dispute between Iran and the United States. Uh, Qatar have a strong alliance with the United States and have uh, a normal relation with, with Iran and this a good relation. Uh, in fact, with, with all this communication that we have, we are sharing with them the gas field, we are using their airspace, and they opened up their country when our neighbors closed their doors. So I think using uh, the benefit of having a good relation with different parties is very important uh, benefit that only enjoyed by the small states, or more enjoyed by the small states than the others. Let me take you a little bit out of your area, because you mentioned, of course, the GCC. Um, uh, the uh, Gulf states, but let's look at Asia. In Asia, you have ASEAN, and many of the smaller states have banded together economically in this case. Talk a little bit and share with the audience the importance of alliances. I mean, on one hand, there are tensions now that exist within the GCC, as you identified, but on the other hand, there are also real value that comes from that kind of association and network. Well, uh, the alliances are, are very important for, for the small states. Any multilateral mechanism for small states matters a lot because it gives it, uh, first of all, uh, a clear principles of, of cooperation between uh, the neighbors and, and the region. It gives it an access to a common market, which is uh, uh, something missing in, in the small states. And, uh, you know, for example, if you, if you look at the ASEAN as, as a bloc, they represent a market for almost 600 million population, which is quite significant. Uh, and if you look at uh, uh, specific states within ASEAN, for example, Singapore, which proved to be a successful uh, small state model, they are only, their population is, is I, I, I think, is almost 5 million uh, people over there. So it can leverage uh, uh, the benefit for, for, for the small states. If you look at our region, for example, GCC. And this mechanism may be now failed in, in addressing the issue, but why don't we look at the bigger picture? Uh, if we have a, a common market within our region, and not just, I'm not talking about GCC uh, uh, only, but GCC, Iran, one day all these issues will be resolved, Pakistan, all of these countries in our region are, are in very close proximity. And, the transportation uh, now between uh, all the countries has become uh, much easier than before. It will multiply the market of the Gulf, of the, the current GCC market, for four or five times at least. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think there is a, a great benefit in, in regional mechanisms. EU, EU, they started the whole concept of, of, of the EU at a cooperation, a principle of cooperation, a principle of, of common market, and now they are 28 countries, and I hope they stay strong alliance, especially after now the debate about the Brexit, but EU is a proof that is a successful example after uh, what happened in, 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 in the Second World War. So I think there are a lot of good examples that we can uh, uh, draw on in, in regional cooperation, and I believe one day this will be realized in our region. What steps would you like to see larger uh, states uh, take uh, in order to produce and engender greater inclusivity for 
those that are smaller? Are there certain steps that you would recommend? And also, uh, take it from the standpoint of your country specifically. Well, uh, larger states, uh, they have, as they are large and uh, they are enjoying a lot of benefits that other small states are, are, are missing, they have a responsibility. A responsibility to protect the world order, to protect the international mechanisms, to protect, uh, uh, to make sure that there is no bad actors uh, uh, allowed to, uh, you know, to play around and to mess around uh, different regions. So uh, I think it's more, it's, it's very important to have uh, the largest states becoming more uh, as as a leader. In, in, in different mechanisms to make sure that these mechanisms are implemented and enforced. Not, you know, we, we can see, uh, uh, for example, mass atrocities happening in, in, in our region, like what's happening in Syria, what's happened with Libya. Now, uh, uh, the president of Presidential Council, he just uh, uh, laid what's, what was happening with, with his country. And we see a disrespect for the international law whose uh, responsibility to protect this international law and to make sure that the international law is applied in, in, in those countries. I think the big states have responsibilities in doing so. Let me also just uh, 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 take this one step further, and that is you have an audience that has come here that represents public-private partnerships, some former government members, non-governmental organizations, the business community. So in that context, what would be your message to them as we'll be uh, closing our session shortly? What is your message? And also, uh, what is it that they need to keep in mind relevant to this key issue? Because it's uppermost in your mind as foreign minister and from where you're sitting. Well. Uh... I think, first of all, we need, we need to protect multilateralism. We need to make sure that it's enforced and has a binding uh, uh, mechanisms. But uh, second, and I think this is uh, my main message, that don't judge the countries based on their size. Judge them on their impact. A small country like Qatar, which is considered a small state, its development, its contribution, uh, how strategically it's positioned, what kind of resources uh, uh, we are blessed with, like, for example, like the LNG. All these things didn't make Qatar as, as a closed small country. But it made Qatar with a, a significant footprint in the world. Our, our uh, development aid is reaching to more than 100 countries. The investment, the Qatari investment is, uh, uh, is everywhere in the world. Uh, uh, our uh, uh, programs for education, for supporting the diplomacy effort, diplomatic efforts or for peacekeeping are everywhere, Sudan, Libya, uh, Lebanon, uh, Djibouti and, and Eritrea. So it's not, it's not really about the size, it's really about the impact and when those small states can lead and can innovate. And with the United Nations General Assembly going on, is that the core? one of the core issues or uh, on your agenda? Well, uh, it's, it has been always in, in our agenda that uh, we, need, we need to focus on serving for, for the good of, of the globe. That uh, whether it's by providing development aid or providing uh, health care for people who doesn't have an access to health care or education for people who are, who are not uh, uh, enjoying the same access, and to stop the mass atrocities that are happening in our region. These are always in, on our agenda. Well, Minister, thank you for coming today. It's uh, most appreciated. Please join me in thanking the Foreign Minister for joining here as Concordia.